So I figured I would just make this more informal than, than an actual presentation since it's the last one that I will be giving here. So I don't know if you may or may not be aware I'm moving to the Muhammad Ali Parkinson Center, which is at the Barrow Neurologic Institute in Phoenix. And so um, I figured I'd give some background as to why that is, <clears throat> because uh, change can be concerning, but it's, uh, it's not in, in this case in particular. So the, the main reason I'm heading out is uh, because of my wife, actually. So she's a, a pediatric oncologist, and uh, she got recruited to Phoenix Children's Hospital. And so I started to, to look around, and, and Barrow was very interested in, in me, mostly to do the same things that I'm doing here, between uh, clinical care patients and also brain imaging research and Parkinson's. And so uh, the way that this will hopefully end up working will benefit uh, everyone. Um, so number one, I'll be continuing the, the brain imaging work that I'm doing here there and continuing the collaboration uh, that has begun here that uh, I was integral as part of developing the neuroimaging program including helping to get the NIH funding that we have that's largely based around the neuroimaging work that we're doing. So that's all going to continue, and, and, and in fact, it'll be even more beneficial because most likely um, there's going to be a new Parkinsonian project as part of the NIH work. So mine will continue, and we'll be able to do something else that we wouldn't have had the opportunity to do were I still here. So that'll be a benefit uh, to grow the research here in Parkinson's and to recruit my replacement. So Dr. Blewett, who many of you may already know, is a very good Parkinson's doctor. Um, he's been here for a little over a year now and has done a great job. He, his patients uh, uniformly um, admire him. Uh, he's great with patients. He's very thoughtful in his approach as a clinician, but also as a person. He's a good guy and uh, does a good job and really cares a lot about clinical care. But this will provide him some breathing room as well uh, to pursue some research interests that he have that mostly centers around falls. And uh, that'll be important in, in a new area of growth for us. And then um, we're under active um, evaluation now of several candidates to, uh, to take over the directorship. And so it's always a good time to get new thoughts in um, from new places. There, uh, all the candidates are from excellent places, including Hopkins. So uh, I expect that we'll, in, uh, probably in short order, have uh, a new director installed who will uh, expand the program. And whenever there's a new director, there are new opportunities, uh, not only clinically, but scientifically. And so that uh, should also be a, a source of excitement uh, uh, for the patients here as well uh, to get uh, fresh ideas and new ways of, of treating Parkinson's and other movement disorders. So in the end, I think this will actually be really good for the program. And any program that's worth its salt uh, can withstand anyone leading it. And, and that better be what happens, or else I haven't done my job. And so I expect that that's exactly what's going to occur. And then Mary Gauthier, who many of you know, who's a nurse practitioner for our movement disorders program, she's staying and uh, will continue her integral role in, uh, in helping with chronic care for, for patients and seeing them uh, under the, initially under the auspices of Dr. Blewett and then whomever takes over the directorship role, uh, Mary will be working with them. We're also in the process of hiring a new um, nurse practitioner to join and augment uh, Mary. So in the end, we expect to have a new director, Dr. Blewett will still be here, Mary will still be here, and we'll have a new nurse practitioner. So hopefully we'll get even a bit of expansion uh, in the program, which will then expand our access to patients, which is obviously going to suffer uh, with uh, one of the two uh, clinicians departing. So hopefully that will help decrease wait times uh, and increase the ability for us to respond you know, more urgently to, to patient needs, uh, which is obviously the primary goal of the program. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to basically take this opportunity to emphasize to everybody that not only is, is my departing uh, uh, not bad, it's actually, in the thing, I think, in the big scheme of things, going to be very good for the program here because it really provides an opportunity for growth in new ways, both clinically and uh, scientifically, and provides an opportunity for a new collaboration with me being in uh, Phoenix that has a much larger a base of Parkinson patients and a, a much richer history when it comes to movement disorders to bring uh, that to bear on our scientific collaboration here, that could end up going quite well and, uh, and I expect that it will. Um, and so I expect to continue to come up here on a regular basis from a scientific standpoint to continue the collaboration. It's obviously not clinically anymore. So I just wanted to kind of give that background and also to give a background on the kind of the remarkable growth that the whole center has undergone uh, since Jeff uh, originally got here. Um, and was seeing just Alzheimer patients uh, as a center. We've grown to include MS and, and Parkinson's and movement disorders. And I obviously inaugurated the program, which initially was just me, and that's expanded and morphed over time, involving several different folks. And um, 
we, uh, I'm proud of the fact that I think we punch above our weight, so to speak. We're a small program, but we have disproportionately a lot of patients, a lot of NIH funding, and a lot of philanthropic funding, and all of that has allowed us to grow and hopefully serve our patients well, uh, and also give them opportunities to participate in trials, which is an area that will grow uh, very shortly, and in, in research. And so that's something that I'm proud of, and it's been a great team to be a part of. And it wouldn't have happened without the, the key members, particularly Mary, and also Dr. Blewett, and then our administrators, um, uh, Karen Strawn, has been with the program for a while and has been integral in helping to iron out some of the logistics that are not trivial in taking care of patients here because we don't have everything on one campus. We have to rely on getting people connected with resources in the community, and Karen's been important in that, as has Dee Dee Newman, our medical assistant, and, uh, and some of the folks on the, on the patient service representative side. So, it's been a, a team effort that I've been very proud to be a part of, and I'm, I'm happy to see it uh, looking like it's going to really flourish and expand, actually, as I, as I depart. So I just wanted to kind of take an opportunity to thank you guys and, um, and really kind of open up to any questions that you may have, either about Parkinson's in general or the program or, or anything else that you had. Yeah, I just, uh, I'm a new patient. I started on Monday with Dr. Blewett, and did I understand right that he's going to stay? That's right. So he's still going to be my doctor. That's correct. Oh, yep. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, anybody? Yeah. Can you talk about traumatic brain injury. As it relates to movement disorder, sure. So um, it's a very interesting area of research. So actually, the place that I'm going was named after someone who uh, developed Parkinson's, largely because of a form of traumatic brain injury that we happen to call boxing. And um, it's, that was really one of the first uh, public figures that, uh, of what we often refer to as an atypical Parkinson's. So classic Parkinson's disease, what we call idiopathic Parkinson's disease, is not related to a clear inciting event, either trauma or otherwise. And, and Muhammad was a, is a great example of, of what can happen in what's called pugilistic Parkinson's, where repeated blows do seem to preferentially damage parts of the brain that are important in developing movement disorders, Parkinson's primary among them. And so it's a big part of it, but how big a part isn't clear? Meaning if you have a concussion, does that predispose you to developing Parkinson's? That's not very clear at all. And actually the data does not suggest that. There have been some reports that any exposure to significant uh, brain trauma like a concussion does seem to increase your overall risk of developing a neurodegenerative disease like Parkinson's, but that link is very tenuous the data is not very strong, and so in my mind and in many others, the jury is still very much out on that. But repeated head trauma, where there's significant repeated losses of consciousness or coma, does seem to increase the development of Parkinson-like features, meaning you can develop tremor, slowness, stiffness, problems with movement, but it's still not clear if that increases the risk of developing Parkinson's disease, meaning the actual disease that's caused by the abnormal synuclein protein that spreads throughout the brain and causes what we call Parkinson's disease. That, that doesn't look to be the case. It looks to be that you damage parts of the brain from repeated trauma that are important in movement and therefore their damage looks like Parkinson's without actually having the synuclein-based Parkinson's disease. But whether there's an interrelationship there and what that is and how that develops over time is very, very hard to study and, and right, right now very poorly understood. But when it comes to traumatic brain injury overall, um, the biggest examples of that are repeated concussions from either combatants, be they military or sports related. And there is pretty convincing evidence that they're at higher risk of development of cognitive impairment, regardless of whether they develop motoric impairment. Uh, but again, what that link means isn't clear. Some of the work that's being done here with Charlie Burnick and, and Sarah Banks is starting to shed some light on that um, over a long period of at least five years of data now, in uh, mostly in boxers. Um, there does seem to be a pretty significant link between repeated head trauma exposure through boxing and the development of uh, cognitive impairment. But whether that, what that means isn't clear, meaning what type of damage occurs, what regions of the brain are important, how does that develop over time? Does it stop? Does it regress? Does it increase the development of other problems like Parkinson's and the abnormal proteins associated with it and Alzheimer's disease? Those links are, are hard to know right now because we don't have enough longitudinal data. But the overall concept that repeated trauma to the brain is bad, although seemingly self-evident, um, is there's more and more data to suggest just why it's bad and how that, uh, how that mediates its impact on both thinking and on movement. Yep. What clinical studies are going on right now? 
So for Parkinson's? Yeah. So we have, we're going to be expanding that very shortly. So there's um, a trial that's going to start up here in, um, hopefully in the next month or so, probably even less, hopefully two weeks, that is a large um, trial run through a, an organization called the Parkinson's Study Group, which is the largest academic um, Parkinson's clinical trial group in, in the world that we're a part of. And that trial is specifically designed not to look at symptomatic therapy. So one of the problems with Parkinson's is we've never had an agent that clearly and definitively slows or stops the accumulation of damage in the brain. There are a number of medications we can use and a number of surgical options that we have to try to minimize the symptoms through a variety of um, mostly interactions with the dopaminergic system in the brain, but that doesn't slow the actual accumulating pathology in the brain and nervous system. This trial is designed to specifically look at that. Can we actually slow the rate of development of the pathology that causes the symptoms rather than just treating the symptoms itself? And so uh, that will be an interesting trial to look at, and it's a, a trial that involves a molecule whose job it is to raise the level of urate in the blood. Urate is more commonly associated with gout. If you have high levels of urate, that's one of the hallmark features that predispose you to developing a gout. It's not the goal of this trial, um, but the, there's been convincing evidence over time that patients who have gout are at decreased risk of development of Parkinson's, and if they do develop, they do at a slower rate. And then, uh, as that was explored more fully, the molecular mechanisms that seem to be um, important in that do seem to be to warrant further investigation, meaning the preclinical data in models of Parkinson's are, are quite suggestive that elevations in urate um, do seem to decrease the risk of developing Parkinson's and do seem to slow its rate of development. And so in early phase clinical trials, the first two, there usually are four phases to clinical trial. Phase one looks at just safety. Is it something that the human being can tolerate? Phase two looks at dosing and safety. And then you get to phase three to see, does this really do what we think it's doing? And so that's what this trial is, is a phase three trial. So the safety has been defined according to FDA regulations. And then the dosing looks to be pretty, pretty solid along with the safety. So now the question is, um, does this really slow the rate of development of Parkinson's? And that's what this trial is designed to do. To see, not to do, but to see if that, so there's gonna be placebo along with the active experiment. So gout is kind of painful, mm -hmm. so. There's no indication from any of the data to date that this increases the rate of development of gout. People who already have gout should not have further elevation of urate levels, but from all of the human data so far, there's no evidence that there's an increase in uh, or the development of gout related to this at all. And so that's one of the trials that's gonna be starting up in just a couple of weeks, so hopefully, if that's the case. And then uh, there should be about at least three other ones coming online in the next six months. Most of those are gonna be geared more toward more advanced patients, patients that have fluctuations, either uh, dyskinesias when they're on their medication or wearing off of the medication. Um, looking at hopefully some, some newer mechanisms of trying to address the symptoms. These are not going to be disease slowing um, trials. These are going to be symptomatic trials. But hopefully those will start to come online in the next couple of uh, two to six months. And then uh, given that we're going to have uh, the new leadership coming on board, uh, there's going to be even more opportunity for more trials after that. So the expectation is over the next six to 12 months, we should blossom quite quickly from a couple of trials to at least five or six. And that would probably be given our, our size of patient population and the number of staff and personnel, probably be a good steady state for us to be at somewhere in the neighborhood of five active trials. And the goal would be to span the different trial opportunities. So it would be nice to have one or two that are looking at disease modification. Can we slow the actual progress regardless of impact on symptoms? A couple that are early phase, patients that have recently been diagnosed, uh, getting new therapies online early on in the disease, and then a couple that are later in the disease. And then uh, some in, in, there's interest in later stages of the disease when dementia can develop and when psychosis or hallucinations can develop in some patients. There are some new, uh, very interesting compounds that show promise in uh, trying to treat those better than we currently do. And so it will be nice to get some of those online. So there's a lot of, of, of different compounds in the pipeline of Parkinson's right now, fortunately. And the key is to make sure that the trials that you select to be a part of, you have a good representation of patient population to do a good job with those trials. And that's where we have to think things through carefully with our clinical trials team. But the, that will probably result in about five trials at any given time, I would expect starting about six to 12 months from now. And you use patients from here? 
appear in those trials? Uh huh. Yeah. And then in addition, we have the, the NIH um, award that we have, um, which is looking at a cohort of patients that um, they are going to be healthy control patients, Alzheimer patients, and then Parkinson patients with and without mild cognitive impairment. This is not a therapeutic trial. No one's given anything to try to change the disease. It's, it's what's called an observational trial, where what we're looking at is, um, can we better understand what's going on in Parkinson patients' brains? Um, especially important when you try to do trials where you want to slow the disease. Right now we have no way of knowing if we're doing that other than looking at the patient, which is important to do, but it tells you no, nothing about what's going on in the brain. So how do you know what the compound is doing and, and, and what is it doing? How is it mediating what it's doing? And so the, the, co the NIH um, study that we have uh, is specifically designed to do a better job of that. Can we use in particular MRI to better understand brain structure, function, and blood flow all of which we know are important in Parkinson patients to better understand diagnosis, response to treatment, and the development of symptoms over time. And that's going to be a five-year longitudinal study um, and a very uh, important part of what we're going to be doing here. And you can still be involved in therapeutic clinical trials and be a part of the NIH Parkinson cohort. Uh, and so that's another one to keep an eye on if you're, if you're interested. Uh, the, uh, the program that Richard Steele has, the training the, for officers, mm -hmm. seems to be beneficial to a Parkinson's patient. Uh, is there an irony in that? <laughs> yeah, there, there's an irony, but he's done a good job of making sure you don't hit anybody in the head. I think that's an important part of the therapy. So, you know, and that brings up a bigger point, which is um, I don't want patients to think that there's one particular therapy that they need or should do. There's no data to support that that is better than any other one. A lot of patients enjoy it, which is great, but uh, some patients don't, and you don't, I don't want people to feel bad because they're not doing th that particular type of therapy. There's a great deal of evidence now, particularly over the last three to five years, of well-organized research that shows that um, exercise, particularly aerobic exercise, the things that get your heart rate, blood pressure going, rather than anaerobic exercise, muscle building, does seem to benefit Parkinson's, decreases the risk of development of cognitive impairment. If cognitive impairment does develop, it, it does so at a slower rate. The patients improve on a variety of uh, motor performance measures. And so the data is excellent, but there's no particular data to suggest, right now at least, that there's one um, exercise or physical therapy regimen that's superior to another. So I would encourage patients to get involved in whatever there's going to be a low bar for them doing, both financially and logistically, because the more you do, uh, the better. And it's become also clear now that doing anything is doing better than nothing. So I don't also want patients to think, oh, I've got to go and climb a mountain or I've got to go join a boxing club. <laughs> what you need to do is something more than nothing. And, and even if you're just doing a little bit, it, the data is pretty clear that that's better than not doing anything. <laughs> Cannabinoid chemicals in relation to the movement disorder? Yeah, so uh, that's uh, been an area of big public interest lately. So cannabinoids are um, the main uh, psychoactive ingredient in uh, marijuana, and medical marijuana, and there are a variety of forms. It's actually a very interesting um, potential story in that if you look at the distribution of the receptors that bind to the cannabinoids in the brain, there are two main subtypes, cannabinoid receptor 1 and 2, CB1 and CB2. They're distributed in areas of the brain that are intriguing when it comes to Parkinson's. They're, they're, they're highly expressed in areas that are important in Parkinson's, but what they're doing is very poorly understood. So the basic understanding of cannabinoid function in the brain is a very immature science right now. And it's equally as possible that um, manipulating cannabinoid receptors could do harm to Parkinson patients, that it is possible that it could do good for Parkinson patients. And right now, there is no uh, well-run clinical trial that suggests that any cannabinoid is of particular benefit in Parkinson's disease. Now, it's always important to not interpret the lack of data as negative data, meaning there's also not good evidence that uh, cannabinoids do specific harm. Having said that, there's very good evidence that cannabinoids do have an impact on cognition, um, a negative impact on cognition. And so that's important to keep in mind in the context of medical marijuana in that there's no good clinical trial evidence that it's good for Parkinson patients. There's no FDA approved measure of medical marijuana for Parkinson patients. And the only data we do have 
that's from really well-run clinical trials and excellent um, research on a more basic level clearly demonstrates that it can be detrimental to cognition, which is obviously important in a disease where you can develop cognitive impairment, and meaningful cognitive impairment develops in about two-thirds of Parkinson's patients over the course of their disease. So um, right now, I would say the jury is very much out and probably won't be in for quite some time. It's hard to do research with particularly tetrahydrocannabinol, the main ingredient in marijuana, because it's very tightly regulated by the government. Uh, so it's hard for scientists to actually just get that the ingredients they need to do the research and then execute the research. Um, and so that tends to slow down the rate of development of understanding of that field. And so we have to bear with that and, and those kind of uh, studies will, will take more time than the average compound would. So are you using it for movement disorders? Just the movement disorder part, not the... No. Thing. Yeah, there's no FDA approved uh, recommendation for the use of movement disorders. Any other questions? Yeah? On, on that line, I make sure I understand what you just said. So what I think I heard you say was there's no studies so far on using marijuana to help with Parkinson's, but yet you've seen where it's made things worse? Right. So there are no good clinical trials. So the phase one, two, three right. clinical trials that, that the FDA looks to to approve or disapprove a compound for use in a particular disease. There's, there's none right now for Parkinson's disease. All that's out there are kind of small anecdotal reports that, that don't meet the criteria that the FDA requires for saying something is or isn't good for a particular disease. We do know from extensive use of, um, of cannabinoids in a variety of circumstances that it impairs thinking, cognition, especially chronic use of, of cannabinoids has a negative impact on memory in particular. So it's going to be something to be very thoughtful about um, in considering even just the science of it. How, how do you structure a good clinical trial, making sure that we don't knowingly worsen memory in patients who already have Parkinson's disease? So it gets pretty tricky to try to even think about how to execute a good trial. Yeah, yeah, they both seem to share the, so the abnormal protein synuclein at their core. The main difference on the pathology side is in Parkinson's, the synuclein uh, tends to gather inside of cells and then can get out of cells. Uh, and the main cells it gets inside of are the nerve cells, the neurons. In MSA, it's, the synuclein tends to stay in non-neurons, other cells called glia, and the glia cells are the ones that support the neurons. They essentially take stuff away that shouldn't be in the neurons, they give neurons stuff they need, and they are kind of symbiotic, uh, so to speak, in that relationship. And the, the, the reason behind the development of the abnormal synuclein in the glial cells in MSA, instead of in the neurons in Parkinson's, is very poorly understood. But this, the, the synuclein is at the, at the core of the pathology in each disease. But the problem with MSA is it's much more rapidly progressive, unfortunately, than Parkinson's. So from the time of diagnosis uh, and the beginning of symptoms, the average mortality is within seven to 10 years. So it's much more rapidly progressive. The medications work minimally, if at all, uh, that we use in Parkinson's. In MSA, indeed, they can actually worsen some of the symptoms. They then have a lot more in the way of different types of motor problems beyond the classic tremor, stiffness, slowness that we see in Parkinson's and they have a lot more what's called autonomic problems where there's fluctuations of blood pressure, problems with urination, uh, problems with heart rate and other functions in a much more dramatic fashion than we see early on at least in Parkinson's and develop a lot more in the way of uh, instability with walking. And so it's a much more aggressive disease. There's much less we can do about it. Fortunately, it's, it's quite rare compared to Parkinson's disease. Uh, but the, the hope is that there's um, quite a bit of interest in MSA now from a pharmacologic standpoint, because we're just beginning to look at the use of antibodies against synuclein. Uh, so to try to use the immune system to get rid of the bad synuclein. So if you have an antibody and it attaches to synuclein, be that in the glial cells in MSA or the neurons in Parkinson's disease, then the immune system will recognize that antibody complex with the synuclein and clear it away. And that's what's already being done in Alzheimer's disease in trials that unfortunately haven't proven beneficial yet, but there's reason to think that they could. 
That same logic is now being applied in, in Parkinson's and in MSA. And those trials are just starting in Europe. They're early phases, as you recall, the phase one, two that I mentioned is just in the phase one and early phase two in Europe. But I expect to see those um, start to develop in, in the States soon. There's only one site right now at Columbia University that's involved in the European studies. But um, there should be quite a bit more. And there's a lot of pharmaceutical interest. So the key is it's really expensive to do any work in, in um, developing a compound on average five to ten billion dollars in 15 to 20 years from the time you have an interesting compound to the time you actually get it to market, presuming that you do. And the, so the reason that's important in, the, in this conversation is that if you want to develop um, a compound that binds to synuclein and gets rid of it in Parkinson's disease, it's really hard to know whether or not you're having an impact for several years because it's a relatively slowly progressive disease. MSA, now you have an opportunity, if you clear synuclein and have a positive impact, you're going to see it on the order of six to 12 months. So in, in, in a way, MSA you know, could be a crucible for understanding what to do about synuclein and Parkinson's disease. So if we can develop an antibody that binds to synuclein and gets rid of it in MSA and make it better, we're gonna know that within six to 12 months and then you can more intelligently try to translate that into Parkinson's knowing that there's gonna be a longer period of time before you would see a potential similar effect. So I actually expect to see more interest in MSA. It's unfortunate that there isn't more interest anyway. It's an underserved population and we've done our effort here to try to raise awareness about it. Uh, but I think that this may end up somewhat ironically um, making MSA more commonly known as these new trials come on because I expect that they'll, they'll be important in MSA almost as a testing ground for, for Parkinson's disease. A comment is Uh, right, so MSA typically affects patients at a younger age than Parkinson's. The average age on, so there's two little peaks in Parkinson's. One is around mid-30s, which is a very small peak, and then the other is usually around 65 to 70 is the average age. In MSA, it's much earlier. Typically, patients are either late 40s or early 50s, actually. And so it's much more common to see that, in, in, but it's still very rare. It's about one out of every 100,000, or one to three out of every 100,000 people that develop it. So it's much less common than Parkinson's. Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, the simple answer to that is no. It doesn't seem to increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, having said that, you don't need Alzheimer's disease to have the problems that you can see, like problems with memory and other uh, cognitive capacities. As I mentioned earlier, about two-thirds of all Parkinson patients over the course of their disease will develop meaningful cognitive impairment, including possibly dementia, without having uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease. There is evidence, though, that there's a subset of patients that's probably a significant minority that have both Alzheimer pathology and Parkinson pathology. And as we're better able to see the pathology using brain imaging, uh, that's more advanced in Alzheimer pathology. There's two, two main proteins that we look for in Alzheimer's, amyloid and tau. We actually have good tracers for, certainly for amyloid, and starting to develop those for, for tau meaning that you can see the pathology that's associated with Alzheimer's in the brain pretty well. You don't have that same luxury in Parkinson's yet. The synuclein, for a variety of physical reasons, turns out to be hard to image in, in, in the brain. Now that's being worked on, and there's reason to be hopeful, but not any time in the near future. And the ultimate goal would then be, in a Parkinson patient, at the time of diagnosis, you could say, okay, well, we can take a look at how much synuclein you have and see if that has any meaning. We don't know if it has any meaning about prognosis. But at the same time, you could potentially look at the amyloid and tau and say, okay, well, you've got lots of synuclein, you've got uh, lots of tau and amyloid, so we know that you're at higher risk for developing Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Whereas somebody else may not have any Alzheimer, excuse me, amyloid or tau, and then we would be able to, with some degree of confidence, say that you're at the lower end of risk for development of Alzheimer's, and, and that would be important. So this is where brain, region, brain imaging becomes so important in, in a disease like Parkinson's. It's not just the diagnosis, it's the prediction of symptom development. Can we use that to, to predict response to treatment, to the, the, the development or increased uh, likelihood of development of side effects? These are all the things that brain imaging potentially would allow you to do that we just don't have the technology yet for, but there's a lot more interest and more and more compounds uh, that are showing promise in our ability to better understand what's going on in the brain in, in Parkinson's. Is there a certain gene identifier that's increasing uh, synuclein development 
Yeah, there are several, um, but they're fortunately very rare. So in Parkinson's disease, less than 5% of all Parkinson's disease seems to be caused by truly a gene mutation, meaning if you have the mutation, you'll get the disease. Uh, that's very rare in Parkinson's. But there are a variety of risk factors that either increase or decrease your risk of developing Parkinson's, genetic risk factors. And they span a broad spectrum of different types of, of genes that don't necessarily have a unifying um, capacity. There is a couple that are more prevalent um, and if you have the gene, you have an increased risk of developing Parkinson's, but it's more of a modifier than it is predictive. Unlike, for example, in Huntington's, where if you have the mutation, you will get the disease. It's just a matter of when. That's very uncommon in Parkinson's, so it makes it really messy, because if you've got X, Y, and Z genes that increase your risk, but then you've got A, B, and C genes that decrease your, well, what's your real risk, and how do you personalize that to that one patient? It's really, really complicated to do that right now. We just don't have that. What does it mean if your diagnosis is Parkinson's Plus? Yeah, so Parkinson's Plus is a, a term that's usually reserved for something that's not Parkinson's disease, regular old garden variety Parkinson's disease. It's often called Parkinsonism or atypical Parkinson's or Parkinson's Plus. And there, there's usually three main ones that people are thinking about. One is called Lewy body dementia or DLB, which looks like Parkinson's, but very early on, almost at the same time you develop the movement symptoms of Parkinson's, you develop significant cognitive and that's one Parkinson plus. Another one is called progressive supranuclear palsy, or PSP, that has some of the features of Parkinson's, but pretty quickly looks a lot different. So it's usually easy to distinguish that, even relatively early on from regular old Parkinson's disease. And that's in a family of diseases that, are, uh, that have that abnormal protein that I mentioned called tau at their core. It's a, mostly a tau problem, what's often called a tauopathy, and falls under a bigger set of diseases called corticobasal syndrome, of one of which is PSP. And then the third is MSA that we've talked about. And then there are a smattering of other things that can make you look like Parkinson's. Certain types of nausea drugs can block dopamine and make you look like you have Parkinson's. Certain types of antipsychotics can. We don't usually call those Parkinson plus, we call them Parkinsonisms, but you can, you can usually figure that out early on. But when it comes to DLB and MSA, it can be very difficult to distinguish them early on. So if someone's only had symptoms for six or 12 months of tremor stiffness slowness, we always need to be thoughtful, even though it can look for all the world like regular old Parkinson's, it may not be. And that's again where the brain imaging becomes important. What's really going on in your brain to cause your symptoms, you don't know that just by looking at somebody and, and hoping that you have a, a, the right idea about their disease. Yep. How often should you ask your doctor to do the imaging? Well, the problem is we don't have much imaging now. Uh, so it's, this is all research that's actively being done. There are very few clinical uh, scans that are FDA approved for Parkinson's. One is called a DAT scan or dopamine transporter scan that looks at essentially the, this particular protein called the dopamine transporter that lives on the cells in an area of the brain that's called the striatum. And that's right at the deep center of the brain and receives connections from a different area of the brain called the substantia nigra, which uh, is one of the main areas, not the only one, but that early on degenerates. And so what it tells you is, have those connections been lost? Because if they are, there's less dopamine transporter. If those connections haven't been lost, then there's more dopamine transporter. And more dopamine transporter often, but not always, means less likelihood of Parkinson's disease. Less dopamine transporter often, but not always, means more likelihood of Parkinson's, but it still doesn't make the diagnosis. And other than that, we only have structural MRI to look at the brain structure, but that's more to rule things out rather than to rule things in. For example, is there a tumor in an area that's causing you to look like Parkinson's, but you don't actually have it? Or do you have a lot of small strokes, what we call microvascular ischemic disease, that's making you look like you're, you have Parkinson's, but don't actually? That's where the MRI is important. But other than the structural MRI and the DAT scan, there's no other FDA approved imaging right now for Parkinson's. It's all in the research stage. Do you do DAT scans here? We don't on our campus. Uh, there's uh, one place in town that I'm aware of that does it at St. Rose uh, Siena campus, and that's where we've been sending our patients. But you don't always need to have one. It all depends on the kind of the clinical context. There's a variety of things that you look for and say, oh, you know, maybe we should get a DAT scan or we shouldn't. It still doesn't give you a definitive answer. It's just one other piece of the puzzle for and oftentimes is not necessary. Yep. Are you going to have any contact with the Andrew Blau Institute? Is, is that in Arizona or New Mexico? And I forget. No, I'm not familiar I'm with that. I'm having a 
I'm not familiar with that. No. Yeah, it could be in New Mexico, but I'm thinking Arizona. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, do other animals, uh, animals, do they acquire Parkinson's? Yeah, it's a great question. The, the answer is, as best we can tell, no, other than unless we give it to them. Uh, we, they don't develop Parkinson's, and most likely it's because they don't live long enough. We're one of the longer-lived species on the, on the planet. And uh, it's mostly, as I mentioned before, a disease of aging. And so we just don't tend to see it quite as much. And it is the, is the leading theory behind that. Um, but no, there's no great evidence that, uh, that animals develop. My mind was going towards felines, and say have a high uric acid. That, that, then they would have less uh, development of Parkinson's, in theory, if this, right. if this trial was made. But there have been some interesting studies very recently um, looking at why does synuclein spread throughout the brain? And uh, does that, is that really the core of why people develop Parkinson's? And, and if you look at that in animal models, if you inject human synuclein into, uh, for example, a rat brain, you can watch it actually spread throughout the, the brain. And they do seem to develop uh, symptoms that are very similar to Parkinson's. And so that's been a very important development because as I mentioned before, if you're trying to do studies to slow Parkinson's in humans, it's really hard to know what's going on because we don't know what's going on in the brain in real time and we have to wait a long time to see if something does or doesn't have an effect. Well, if you can essentially give a rat Parkinson's, then you can start to test molecules and see, does it seem to slow the rate of progression? Does it seem to stop the synuclein from spreading abnormally? And then gain confidence that this is a compound we should be more interested in in humans. We haven't had that kind of modeling before except over just the last really two or three years. And so that hopefully will really help kind of expand our ability to be more aggressive about testing compounds and therefore get them into appropriate trials faster. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, uh, any other questions? Yep. Does alcohol have any physical affect Parkinson's in any way if you drink? There's no data to suggest that alcohol itself increases the risk for development of Parkinson's. But in Parkinson patients, they often, not always, but often will have a disproportionate response to alcohol, especially Parkinson patients where they have cognitive impairment or unsteadiness, gait instability. Uh, they have to be very careful with alcohol because they tend to be more susceptible to the effects, including even at very low doses of alcohol even just having a glass of wine, they can feel more unsteady or may have more slowing of their thinking. And so you have to be very careful about it. But there's no evidence even then that it's enhancing any of the damage. It just seems to, in, during the period where someone has that drink, uh, does have some symptomatic impact. But there's no data to suggest that it's, it's doing anything harmful at, at moderate doses. So that's, a, that's data from mostly from a disease called essential tremor, where patients will often notice that if they have a glass of wine or some other form of alcohol, that their tremors will quiet down. The problem, there are several problems with that. One is it's not necessarily a specific effect. It could be because there's anxiety or other issues. Two, there tends to be a rebound tremor in essential tremor. So if they, for example, have a couple of glasses of wine at night and notice that their tremor quiets down, then next morning, they'll actually notice that their tremor is worse. So it's not a good therapeutic agent, but it is a question we often ask patients because we tend to see it more commonly in essential tremor. It doesn't make a diagnosis. And it becomes interesting in that the, the, the effects of alcohol are mediated through a neurotransmitter system that some of the medications we use uh, for essential tremor are also mediated through. And so it may be a sign that it's a, a kind of a, 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 a clue that the patient may have essential tremor and may be more likely to respond to a certain type of medication. There's no definitive data that shows that, but it's another way of interpreting that, that phenomenon. But it's not a, a good therapeutic agent specifically because of the rebound tremor the next day. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't appear to be the same in Parkinsonian tremor. It's more in the action and postural tremor syndromes where the main tremor occurs when the patients are using their hands rather than in Parkinson's where the main tremor occurs when it's at rest.
Yeah. Is there any relationship between people with Parkinson's and people who um, get depressed? Yeah. So uh, there's very good data that shows that the depression and the anxiety, two main mood disorders that we see in Parkinson's, are directly related to damage to parts of the brain whose job it is is to maintain serotonin, which is called the raphe nucleus. It's deep in the brain. Actually, it's, it, it tends to develop preceding the motor symptoms, sometimes by up to five to ten years. So it doesn't mean if you have depression you'll get Parkinson's, but it's one of several features that we often see in Parkinson patients well before they develop the classic motor symptoms because of the spreading pathology um, and the way that tends to go in patients. It usually starts in the nose and the gut, so some of the earliest symptoms are loss of smell and constipation. Then it tends to progress upward through the base of the, of the brainstem and involve areas that are important for um, mood as well as for sleep. And so the classic features we tend to see are a mood disorder like depression and anxiety, loss of smell, constipation, and then rapid eye movement sleep disorder. And if you have all four of those, the likelihood that you'll develop Parkinson's is extremely high. By some estimates, 100%. And so right now, there's a big interest in can we leverage that to have an idea of who's going to develop the disease. And so right now, there's a large trial looking at about 25,000 people who are answering questionnaires, basically. And it's a very simple test. You have a scratch and sniff card, essentially, a scale that says how depressed or anxious are you, a scale that says how much constipation that you have. And this is just a patient or a person just filling these scales out. And then someone who has a bed partner who says, yeah, they, they act out their dreams at night. So it's a really cheap way to say this person's at very high risk. And then if you have all four, you're at extremely high risk of developing, especially with the rapid eye movement sleep disorder, acting out dreams at night. If you have three, you're at increased risk. Two, somewhat increased risk. One, not so much. And so you can start to try to risk stratify patients according to that and get them into studies to see what happens to these people. Uh, what does their brain imaging look like? Um, and are there things if this, for example, this trial comes out to be positive and does show that elevation of urate is helpful, well, you want to get that into the right patient early before they start to have movement symptoms. And so this is a way of looking at pre-motor Parkinson's, essentially. And we'll see if that bears out, but it's a, an interesting study that's being done right now. What are the benefits to early diagnosis then? Yeah, the, the benefits are, are mostly that, in my opinion, that you want to have a handle as best you can on what's going on and therefore know what the treatment options are or not, and also know what um, some of the considerations that you need to take are or are not. Meaning that we can't stop or slow the disease right now, although hopefully that will change, and then that makes it an obvious answer to that question. But it's still important to get diagnosed early on because you can uh, think through treatment options carefully, you can be water watched and monitored closely, you can start to do the right things like exercise, et cetera, that we know do seem to have benefit. And um, you can be involved in, in trials looking at patients that uh, are early diagnosis. So there's a number of benefits that I see to early diagnosis, but the one benefit that isn't there yet is that it will fundamentally change the progress of the disease itself, although again, hopefully that will change. But having said that, patients who are treated have a better quality of life than patients who aren't overall, which seems obvious, but there's a lot of hesitation on the part of people, and understandably, to take medication um, early on in the disease. And that's okay, but you don't want to be in the position where you're delaying treatment to the, to the extent that you're having an unnecessary negative impact on your quality of life. And again, that's where getting in, getting early diagnosis and having that continuing conversation with your care provider allows you to make smart choices and thoughtful choices and keep abreast of what new um, new therapies are coming online. As I mentioned, there's probably about 120 different clinical trials going on nationally right now in varying forms. So the point is there's a lot of new stuff out there, and that's just pharmacologic options. Then there's also DBS and other surgical techniques. And the earlier you have that conversation and continue that conversation, I think the better it is for the, for the patient because you have a better handle on what's going on, what the options are, and you stay up to date on what all that means. doesn't slow development at all, it treats symptoms. And so uh, unfortunately, none of them stop or slow the accumulating pathology in the brain, that abnormal synuclein that's spreading to different areas. But they can be very beneficial for symptoms, especially if they're tolerated well. And so they're very helpful medications, unlike, for example, in Alzheimer's, where the treatment options for symptoms are extremely limited. 
we have a lot more treatment, op treatment options, uh, pills as well as brain surgery that just don't exist in essentially any other neurodegenerative disease. So we can still do quite a bit for patients, not always, but often we can. And the main goal there is what can we do to optimize quality of life and, but minimize side effects. But no, we can't stop our slow progression at this time. And exercise is really essential. Exercise looks to be a, a key part. And I will tell you anecdotally in taking care of my own patients that the ones that exercise regularly fundamentally do better than the ones that don't. So if you are treating two patients that have similar disease um, severity, similar age of onset, otherwise similar um, uh, ways of living, and one doesn't do exercise regularly, the other one does, and you watch them for five years, it, it, it's a pretty big difference. In my mind, it's almost like another medication. And there are other benefits, so there is good data to suggest that there's positive um, benefit for constipation, for mood disorder, uh, in addition to cognition, and it also is important in maintaining muscle and bone mass with, with age is very important because lowering muscle mass and bone mass, which is very common as we age, is uh, associated with increased risk of fracture, hip fracture. These are the kind of things that get people in trouble. So there's all kinds of ancillary benefits to exercise. And if you take that sum total versus someone who doesn't do it, in my mind, it's, it's almost like not being on a medication that you could otherwise be on. And yeah, diet, there's no good data to suggest that there's a specific diet uh, or, or way of eating that's better for, than another in Parkinson's. But healthy living does seem to matter. So the same things that are good for the heart do seem to be good for the brain. So eating healthily does seem to be important overall, but there's no particular diet that seems to benefit Parkinson's disease itself. Great. Well, thanks very much. Appreciate it.